there talking uh, with me to be able to stand and declare what the Lord is saying. To Pastor Paul, God, I'm so grateful to you as a pastor and as your leadership. Wherever you are, just give God praise for our pastor, for what he's doing, how he's been steadfast and leading us to the best of time. We thank God for our overseers, even in their absence, and also to Lady Ebony, whom I love. I'm looking right at you, sitting in the streets, and you thank you right back. To each of our leaders, to the elders, to pastors who are here, to everyone in your respective places, thank God for you. I never stand without the opportunity to also thanking God for my husband, Kevin, who stands by my side and puts up with me. Amen. 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 Let us look to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, how great is thy name. We honor you and we thank you, O God, for the opportunity to come together to consider your word. Father, we need a word from you. God, your people are listening for you, looking for you, seeking you, O God. I ask, O God, in the name of Jesus, that I would decrease, that your spirit and power would increase within me, Father. Speak through me. Let your words come forth with power, authority, and clarity to meet the needs of your people. We love you, Father, in advance of what you shall say and do. Now, O God, I ask, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, God, let it be acceptable and in thy sight, for you, O Lord, are my strength and my redeemer. Have your way, Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may have your seats. The theme for this month is marching orders. The phrase marching orders has a variety of meanings. On one hand, when a person gets fired from work, they are given their marching orders. On another, whenever a person is given direction on how to complete a task, they are given their marching orders. Originally, however, the terminology of marching orders is a military term. When a soldier is given their marching orders, their commander or superior officer gives instructions to the soldier on who is to go, how long the mission will take, where they are to go, what they are supposed to do, and when they are supposed to leave. Oftentimes, however, marching orders leave out one important piece of information that leaves many soldiers trying to figure it out on their own. Many times, marching orders fail to tell us why. Why do we have to do this? And why do we have to go there? And why do we have to go right now? Why? Ex executing marching orders may mean not knowing everything beforehand, but still following the directions and the instructions of your commanding officer. This morning, we will look at what far too many of us may be a familiar text of scripture. But with the aid and the assistance of the Holy Spirit, I believe we can take a new ladle, put it into an old well, and come out with some fresh water. If you will, turn with me in your Bibles to Mark, the sixth chapter, verses 45 through 52. Mark, the sixth chapter, verse 45 through 52. And I will be reading in your hearing out of the New King James Version. And it reads us this. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. When he saw them straining and rowing, for the wind was against them, now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. They cried out, for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went into the boat to them, and the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. My focal verse will come from the B clause of verse 50. But immediately he talked to them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. This morning, I would like to teach and preach from the text and the title called, 
a call to revelation. Pastor started off with a call to formation. Now we have a call to revelation. This text for all of us may be an also too familiar text of scripture. Many of you may have read the parallel versions of the same account in Matthew 14 or John 6. Luke is the only gospel writer that does not record this event. After feeding the 5,000 men, not counting women and children, with five fish and two loaves of bread, Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him to go to Bethsaida. We can't miss one of the reasons why Jesus sends his disciples ahead of him. He sends them away because John 6.15 tells us that Jesus realized that the crowd was coming to take him by force to make him king. The Jews believed that Jesus was that prophet, the promised one that Moses had promised them in Deuteronomy 18.15 when he said, The Lord your God will raise up a prophet like me from among you. The Jews thought that their Messiah would become a conqueror. Therefore, the crowd reacted violently and sought to capture Jesus to take him to Jerusalem and make him their king. They wanted Jesus to assume political leadership, to set up a kingdom, and to release them from the yoke of bondage of the Roman authority. Jesus knew that his disciples would either try to convince him to become king prematurely to appease the people, or when the Jews came, that the, the disciples would try to take them by force, and disciples, specifically Peter, would be ready to fight and even kill on Jesus' behalf. John said in 1836, Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest to the Jewish leaders. At first glance, Jesus needed his disciples gone for their own good. The Bible declares that immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat to go to the other side. That word made, anakazo, means constrained, compelled to drive and to do so with urgency as pressing necessity. When you look at the tense voice and mood, it's in the aorist tense, active voice and perfect mood. As an aorist and perfect tense, it means a call for a decisive decision and a choice made that they must do it right now, at once, once and for all, in one quick action. Made in the aorist imperative, if you look at it in contrast, a present imperative, when you read Matthew 7, 7, where the Bible says, ask, and it shall be given, seek, and he shall find, knock, and the doors will open. That ask, seek, knock is in the present imperative, means that it's a command of a habitual action. It means that you continue to do it. You can keep asking, you keep seeking, and you keep knocking. But here, he said, don't keep doing it. I need you to do it one time, and I need you to do it immediately because I'm commanding you to do so. Jesus made or constrained on a cot, it implies reluctance on the part of the disciples. We're dealing with the marching orders, right? So sometimes Jesus has to make us do some things we're reluctant to do, but he knows it's necessary for us. Jesus made his disciples to get into the boat and to go before him to the other side while he sent the multitude away. Jesus did not mention the rough waters ahead of them. He did not mention the storm ahead of them. He didn't tell what they were about to face. He just sent them to the other side. He didn't mention the storm to the disciples, and he doesn't mention the rough road ahead for you and I, because here's my point. Number one, where you are going is more important than what you are going to go through. Jesus said you would get the job and the promotion, but he didn't tell you that they would hate you, lie on you, and backstab you, because where you are going is more important than what you have to go through. God said you would graduate from school, but he didn't tell you that you have some difficult teachers and some lying friends, because he knew where you were going is more important than what you have to go through. God said you have a healthy relationship, but he didn't tell you you'd have some fake friends and some true enemies, because where you're going is more important than what you have to go through. Come here, Joseph. God showed him in a dream that his brothers, his mother, and father would lie or would, uh, would have to buy that bow down to him. But God didn't tell him that his brothers would hate him. He didn't tell him that his brothers would try to kill him. God didn't tell him he would be thrown into a pit, sold into slavery. God didn't tell him that he would be lied on in Potiphar's house. God didn't tell him that he would be thrown into jail. God didn't tell him that he would be forgotten every two years. Why? Because where Joseph was going was more important than what he had to go through. God said to the pastor, expand the house of God, but he didn't tell him that there would be some problems and some people and some difficulties with the permit because God knew where the life was going was more important than what they had to go through. Don't be so caught off guard when where you're going doesn't match up with what 
Jesus set for you to go through. Why? Because it was that important. What do you mean, Pastor? Stop making things that are insignificant become important. Stop majoring in the minor at the University of Insignificance. Where you are going is important, but what you're going through, no matter how bad it may seem, is not important. Why do you ask? I'm glad you did, because it's only temporary. You may be sick, but it's only temporary. You may have family problems. It's only temporary. You may not have all the money right now, but it's only temporary. Disappointment, temporary. Discouragement, temporary. I can thank God right now, because trouble don't last always. I don't know when it's going to be over. I don't know how it's going to be over, but I know that I can go through it because he sent me to it, and so I know it shall come to pass. I know all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord to call according to his purpose. It may not be good to you, but it's good for you. Although it's temporary, Jesus wants you to learn something along the way. Jesus made them go while he stayed. As Christians, as disciples of Christ, we often get locked into the thought that what I'm doing is only right if I'm doing it with Jesus. Hmm. Now, if that's true in the sense of wanting to be where he is, it's true in the sense of wanting to go where we follow him, where he sends you. But sometimes it means going before him just because he told you to go. The omniscient, all-knowing God sometimes knows in order to have a revelation into the knowledge of who he is, he must keep some things from you in order for you to learn more about him. In order for him to reveal himself, he must conceal some problems from us. Jesus knows if he would have told you to go up front, listen, go over to the other side, you're going to encounter a life-threatening situation, but I'm not going to go with you. Many of us are like, oh, mm -mm, no, no, that can't be Jesus talking to me. Oh, no, no, that's not Jesus telling me to do something. Jesus wouldn't send me into a life-threatening situation without him, but he said, my sheep, listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. According to Mark, immediately, Jesus made the disciples to get into the boat, go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd and sent the disciples on their way. He didn't tell them what they were about to encounter. They didn't predict what was about to happen to them. They had not planned for what they were about to go through. They were not prepared for what was coming up. They got into the boat and began to the other side of the sea. Many of the disciples were fishermen by trade and were used to crossing the Sea of Galilee. They were used to the sporadic storms that arose on the sea, and they were familiar with how to difficult and maneuver difficult waters. Now the sea is about eight miles wide, and by boat, this trip should have taken them about 90 minutes. John 6 records that when evening came, the disciples went down to the sea and got into the boat. Evening is around 6 o'clock p.m. As they keep rowing, darkness falls, and the Bible says that Jesus had not come to them yet. It's dark, the ride is getting rough, and no Jesus in sight. They've been rowing for hours against strong winds and rough seas, and Jesus is nowhere in sight. These are his disciples obedient and faithful to his will and his way, struggling in the dark. The water is tossing the boat, the wind is blowing in every direction, and they can't see where they are, nor can they see where they're going. Tired from walking with Jesus all day, seeing miracle upon miracle, word of God on top of word of God, they didn't expect to find themselves dealing with this kind of situation. Now, it's not that you don't expect to go through difficult times. It's not that you don't expect to go through storms every now and again. But you've never been in this kind of storm before. Mm. It takes the disciples nine hours to have traveled about three or four miles in the dark, agitated, shaken to and fro by the wind and the waves. They're struggling in the dark. And you begin to wonder, wait a minute, is it supposed to be this hard? 
You've been at it for a long time and you should be further along in this, but you didn't expect it to be this hard. You don't mind working hard and you don't mind hard work, but come on, you didn't expect it to have to go through this much, this long and it to be this hard. You had your children in your 20s, now you're in your 50s and 60s, still raising children because you didn't expect to have to go through this much or this long and it to be this hard. You started college when you was in your teens and now you're in your 40s and still haven't graduated because you didn't expect to have to go through this much for this long and it to be this hard. Now it's not a motorized boat, it's a rowboat with a sail on it. It takes power and strength of the disciples to get this boat to move. It takes all of the disciples' power and strength to roll the boat. You know the word, and while you keep straining to keep your boat afloat, you try to encourage yourself with stricter. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, yet not in despair. We are persecuted, yet not forsaken, struck down, and yet not destroyed. After all, this isn't your first time in your walk with Christ that you've had to face hard times. You know that you're going to make it, and so you rely on the word of God to keep you going. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Nay, in all things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You keep strengthening yourself with the word of God. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say the Lord is my refuge, my fortress, my God. In him will I trust. The Lord is my shield and my strong tower. The righteous run to it and are saved. You keep going through the pain. You keep going through the strain. And after a while, your back start hurting. Your arms start getting tired. You're out of breath. And you realize... I still got a long way to go. You look around to get encouragement from other Christians, and then you realize they in the same boat as you are. The wind and the waves are against you. The wind and the air is around you. The wind is representing what's against you. The air is representing around you. You have been listening to the other Christians. Don't breathe on me. Don't cough on me. Don't get more than 10 people together. Can't go to the grocery store. Can't go to a restaurant. Stop coming to church. You look for encouragement from the other Christians, and they got on a mask. They got hand sanitizer in one hand, Lysol in the other hand. Ooh, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked. But while you're looking for other Christians, you realize they in the same boat as you're in. You look for help with your spouse, and they having troubles with theirs. You call looking to them to help and support with your children, and they struggling with their grandchildren. You wondering how you gonna pay your rent, all your money spent. You call them, but they telephone this and that. Can't wait on the max tape paycheck. What do you do when the other Christians are in the same boat as you're in? Well, what do you do when you call your prayer partner and before you can talk to them about your problems, they say, "Ooh, I was just about to call you and talk to you. Can you pray with me about my problem?" We in the same boat. Let's take a page out of Paul and Silas' life. See, they were beaten, thrown into prison, then put in the middle cup in the court, in the prison, cuffed and chained. The Bible declares that at midnight, that's when it's the darkest. At midnight, that's when your past and your future start meeting. It's at midnight when the forces behind you push you into your future. It's at midnight when they were beaten and battered and bruised that the Bible says that they started praying and singing hymns. The prison was real. The restrictions of the cuffs were real. The wind and the waves are real, but so is our God. When the wind represents the forces you can't see, like an airborne virus, and the wave represents forces you can't control, like a viral pandemic, when they are against you, I dare you to start praying. Isaiah 65, 24 says, before you call, I will answer and show you great and mighty things. He says, when you call, I will answer, and while you're praying, I will hear. Jeremiah says, call unto me, and I will answer you. We've got to start praying, saints. David says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me. In the darkness and in despair, whatever the trouble and the circumstance you find yourself in, I dare you to start singing praises and praying. I dare you to start praising and singing. Old songs said it like this, trouble in my way, I've got to cry sometimes. So much trouble, I've got to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night, but that's all right, because Jesus can fix it after a while. I know some of y'all may be seasoned and have a little old school in you like me. Mahalia Jackson said it like this, precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. I Let me stand. I'm tired and I'm weak and I am warm, but through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me on. Pastor Joel, I know you may not know anything about
about those old songs where the priest says it like this, just fight a little longer, my friend. It's all worth it in the end. We got to find some partners, and then when you start, you when you're singing, you got a partner that ain't scared to start praying for you. Start saying stuff like, Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, where should I go? See, what I love about the disciples is they did not quit. As hard as it was, as dark as it was, as dim as it was, they kept working to make it through. And that's what disciples do, as dark as it is, and as bad as it is. Point number two, it's only enough to take you on and not take you out. The Bible declares that the boat was in the middle of the sea, tossed to and fro by the waves being against them. Although you're in a difficult time, Right now, and although things seem bad right now, it's only bad enough to take you on. It's not bad enough to take you out. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know how bad it may be for you, but old song says, I don't feel no ways tired. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me that this road would be easy, but I don't believe he brought me this far to lead me. You've come too far through heartache and pain. You've come too far through disappointment and discouragement. You've come too far through illness and disease. You've come too far, and I don't know what you believe, but I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Come here, Job. And one day he lost his servants, his livestock, his sons, and his daughter. Sickness hit his body, and his wife came to tell him to curse God and that. But Job said, woman, you're talking foolish. Shall we accept good and not trouble? I don't think God brought me this far just for me to go out like that. I don't believe he brought us this far to leave us. I don't care how strange you are, how tired you are, mentally, physically, emotionally, and you may have given it all you can, and you think things are not getting better, but I'm here to tell us to keep on going. You've got to have faith in knowing. I may not know when Jesus is coming, but I know he's coming to save us. Old songs say he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. When you're at your stretching point, your stretching point ain't your breaking point. It's your growing point. You're growing in your faith. You're growing in your prayer life. You keep on growing. The Bible says that at the fourth watch of the night, that's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., that they saw Jesus coming closer to the boat. A 90-minute boat ride has taken them at minimum nine hard hours, and they see Jesus. But the truth of the matter is that Jesus never could not see them. That was their first time seeing Jesus, but while he was on the mountain, the Bible says he saw them towing and rowing, but the wind was contrary to them. On the mountaintop, he sees. On the valley low, he sees. Jesus sees what we're going through, and he shall come. Now, when the Bible says Jesus watched them strain and came to them and was about to pass them by, that caught me off guard. Why would Jesus watch them struggle and straining and not come to their rescue, but almost pass them by? The Bible doesn't say, but let me encourage us this morning to tell you that your breaking point is your stretching point. It's time to stretch us in our faith, prayer, and study because Jesus sees what we're going through and he shall come. I can have at least one. It's just a few of us in here, and even you online, know that you can look back over your life and know that you've gone through some things that you thought were going to break you, but actually all it did was stretch you. You thought you were going to go through some things that would destroy you, but all it did was help you grow. And that's where it is. Don't lose faith in where you are. Keep stretching and growing. Mark 6 said Jesus was walking on the sea and would have passed them by. The disciples were so afraid that they almost let Jesus go by them. They didn't recognize him because he was coming to help them in a way that they hadn't expected him to come, nor in the way that they'd seen him operate before. The Bible says they cried out, they cried out with a loud cry because they saw him and were terrified. Whatever situation you're in, don't be so afraid of your situation that you miss crying out to Jesus. They saw Jesus and were afraid. 
They had seen him do miracles after miracles. They had seen him do things before he, to still deliver people before delivering people. But they had never seen anything like this and they were scared. Whenever you're not sure of what you see, listen to what is said. Here's the beauty of the text for me. Jesus speaks to them. The power is not only in the fact that he spoke to them, but it's what he said to them. In the English language, it's recorded that Jesus said, it is I. But in the Greek, it's translated, echo ethne. It's two words that he said. He says, I am. This is the first time Jesus reveals his deity to the disciples. The doctrine of the deity says that Jesus Christ possesses the same attributes as God. That includes his omnipotence, that includes his omniscience, he's all-knowing, all-powerful, and his omnipresence, that he's everywhere at the same time, his immutability, he's unchanging, he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He is eternal without beginning, ending, and forever lasting. Some scholars suggest that the statement is actually a theophany, referring to God's statement to Moses in Exodus 3, verse 6. God says, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Verse 8 says, I am come down to deliver you out of the hand of the Egyptians. And when Moses said to God, behold, when the children of Israel go to them and say to them, they asked me, what is the name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am that I am. Tell the children of Israel, I am have sent me. Jesus is trying to reveal himself to his disciples. Here's my final point. God can let you go through some storms in your life so that you can experience Jesus in a new way. Here's the call to revelation. Jesus is using your current circumstance and situation, trying to reveal himself to us in a way we had not experienced before. See, I only heard that he was a healer until I was diagnosed with cancer, and now 10 years later, I'm cancer-free. Now I know he is a healer. I only heard he was a protector until I laid on my grandmama's floor through a tornado, and the other houses around us were destroyed, and our house still stands. Now I know he is a protector. John records seven scriptures where Jesus declares his deity. But Jesus didn't declare it to the unbelievers until he shared it with his disciples. Jesus needed his disciples to be clear on his deity before sharing it with the sinners. Unfortunately, some of us are still unclear of the deity of Jesus Christ. John records in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. 8, 12, I am the light of the world. 10, 7, I am the door. 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. 11, 25, I am the resurrection of life and the light. 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the light. 15, 1, I am the true vine. And John says it in 8, 58, before Abraham was, I am. He identifies himself to the disciples as I am and leaves it as a complete statement, but a seemingly an incomplete sentence. Hmm, what do you mean? I'm glad you asked. In other scriptures, he says, I am this or I am that. Here, he just says, I am, and lets you fill in the blank. For whatever you need, he says, I am. Grandma used to say, he's the bridge over troubled water. He says, I am. He's the wheel in the middle of a wheel. He says, I am. He's my leading post. I am. He's the way out of nowhere. He says, I am. This is the call to revelation. So who is the great I am? Well, I'm glad you asked. To the artist, he is altogether lovely. To the astrologer, he is the bright and morning star. To the baker, he is the living bread. To the biologist, he is the life. To the builder, he is the chief cornerstone. To the doctor, he is the great physician. To the educator, he is the great teacher. To the farmer, he is Lord of the harvest. To the florist, he is the rose of Sharon. To the geology, he is the rock of ages. To the hematologist, he is the blood born brother. To the jurist, he is our righteous judge. To the jeweler, he is the pearl of a great high price. To the lawyer, he is the advocate. To the musician, he is the horn of salvation. To the publisher, he is the publisher of great tidings. To the philosopher, he is the word of God. To the preacher, he is the word of God. To the theologian, he's the author and finisher of our faith. To the traveler, he is the way. To the New Heights ministry, he is Yahweh Hamashiach. To the zoologist, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. To the sinner, he is the sacrificial lamb of God. 
storm. Call on the name of Jesus. Call on the name of Jesus. He's our savior. He's our sustainer. Matthew records that when they got to the ship, the wind ceased and they worshiped God saying, surely you are the son of God. That record, he was willing, they got him in the ship and then the wind immediately died. And they said, surely you are the son of God. Matthew talks about how the wind stopped, the storm was over, their situation was no longer life-threatening, and the disciples worshiped him saying, surely you are the son of God. John talks about them willingly receiving Jesus into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land where they were headed. Hmm. Remember, Luke didn't record and say anything about what happened once Jesus got to the ship. He didn't say anything from the beginning, but what Mark said threw me for a fast one. It took me off guard. Verse 51 and 52. Then when, they, then when he went up to the boat to them, the wind ceased, and they were greatly amazed in themselves, beyond measure and marveled. Here it is. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. The disciples were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure. They were in utter amazement. What Jesus did blew their mind. Why were the disciples in such amazement? Why were they so in so much awe because of what Jesus did? Verse 52 tells it. They did not understand what Jesus did before with all of the five loaves of bread because their heart was hardened. That, that, that shook me a little bit. Their hearts were hardened. Difference in it, it wasn't because of the hardness of their hearts. Their heart was hardened. Hardness of the heart means they opposed Jesus. They resisted him. That's not what the Bible is saying. A hardness of the heart means a person, their mind was dull. They couldn't perceive what was going on. They were slow to understand. Although they had seen Jesus feed 5,000 with children and men and women, they didn't understand that the same power he just used is the same power he had the ability to use to save them. Although they were going somewhere and going through something they had never experienced before, their faith failed in a crisis. Peter got out of the ship and walked on the water, but as soon as he began to look around at his situation, he began to sink, and Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith, why for didst thou doubt? Every crisis the disciples found themselves in when Jesus wasn't with them, every time they experienced anguish, it was because of the lack of their faith. I know you're saying, but we've never been through anything like this before. I hear you. I understand. 2001, it was anthrax. 2002, West Nile virus. 2003, it was SARS. 2005, it was bird flu. 2006, it was E. coli. 2009, the swine flu. 2014, the Ebola virus. 2011, the Zika virus. 2020, the coronavirus. All these things, Jesus is saying, be of good cheer. I am. The storm the disciples were going through was real. I'm not trying to minimize the storm. I'm trying to maximize the Savior. Yes. In this power of love, stop focusing on the storm and start focusing on Jesus Christ. Jesus is trying to reveal himself to us. When you know who he is, you know he can do anything but fail. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Believers, let's look and see what Jesus is doing. Because he has the ability to deliver us through everything we're going through if we just trust him. Let's not let our faith fail in this crisis. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. Amen.